invite you to turn in your bulletin, take out the insert, uh, sermon notes, Faith is a Journey, and our message today is based on the New Testament lesson that uh, Lori read just a moment ago from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where God uses various people, and uh, he's the one who grants the growth. Well, I want to congratulate all of you for being here this morning. I mean, getting here on a Sunday morning, that's quite a job, isn't it? And you, you know, the alarm rings. Did you get the snooze? Maybe. Maybe you jumped right out of bed. And uh, there's some things you got to do. You got a bite to eat for breakfast. Uh, maybe grab a shower. Uh, you know, you, uh, what? Uh, guys maybe shaved and uh, the ladies hair makeup those kinds of things had to find the car keys soon you know it's going to take a little bit more it's going to get colder and you're going to brush the snow off the car and scrape the windows we don't want to talk about that though do we so getting ready in the morning there's this process there's several steps and some of those steps have to be in order you don't get dressed before you take a shower. That has to come after. Uh, and we often get so used to the process that what? It's a routine and we just do it kind of mindlessly without thinking. So suppose this morning on the way to church, he said, you know, I really want a cup of coffee. So you go to the fast food restaurant and there too, it's this process, you kind of look on the pavement, okay, drive through lane here, and you get in line, and you pull up to the first, uh, by the menu there, and the person says, hello, welcome. You know, how can I help you? And you shout, I want a cup of coffee. You know, and they say, okay, pull to the first window, that'll be $18, and uh, you pull up there, and you, you pay for it, and then the next step, while you're driving to the next window, you look down at all the junk that you put in the cup holders. You gotta get rid of that. So you got a place to put the coffee. And the next window, you get the cup of coffee, and you you, you know, carefully, without spilling it all over your lap, you put it down in there, and then you can drive away. There's a process. And inside the restaurant, there's a process going on too, isn't there? There's somebody who's talking through the little microphone to take your order, and somebody else is uh, gonna take your money, somebody's pouring the coffee, and another person's getting the right stuff in it, and the lid on it, and finally it's the person at the window who makes sure you get what you ordered, and says, thank you, have a nice day, and off you go. Well, it was about 100 years ago when Henry Ford started the Ford Motor Company, he didn't invent the automobile. He wasn't the first, and his cars weren't the best or the fastest, but what he came up with was a new process for putting a car together. He broke it all down into a series of steps and said, well, we'll have one person do this over and over all day long, and we'll move it along, and he invented what we know today as the assembly line. And that's what made the cars affordable so that people could buy them and that put America on wheels and changed America greatly. Now that same idea later during World War II was used to make something a lot more complex with a lot more parts to make airplanes. And so in cities in the upper Midwest like Cleveland, here is where the equipment was made that won the war, and some of you remember those days. And when it comes to our relationship with God, your faith journey is a journey. It's a process. In the Bible, God says it's like uh, a growth that happens when a seed is planted in the soil, and at first it sprouts. And then it begins to grow, and then it gets mature, and then it reproduces. That's what we heard in today's gospel reading. Or God says he compares your faith relationship with him to a runner in a race. A runner's got to plan and then train. And then the day comes and lined up at the starting line, and the 
gun goes off and begins to put one foot in front of the other and has to keep going at it. Has to be persistent to make it all the way to the finish line. God says your relationship with him is like a man wooing a young woman. First they meet, and then they notice each other. In time, one of them asks the other out for a date. And if all goes well, there's a second date, and then a third, and then a whole lot, and then they fall in love and get engaged and then married, and then they spend a lifetime together. And you see our relationship with God. God's loved you. God has chosen you. And he pursues you. He calls you to him, calls you back to him each day. He wants to shower his love on you. And he wants you to love him back, to keep growing deeper in love for him. One day in heaven, you'll spend forever with him. Have you ever started a diet program or an exercise program? Many of us have, okay, you know? And when you start a diet program or an exercise program, don't you start with these really good intentions. You've got all the determination in the world, and you know that, you know, just one workout isn't going to get you in shape. You've got to do these workouts each and every day over and over for a long time. It's a long process. But before you know it, what happens? You give up. You end up kind of like this guy from doing crunches to couch surfing. And, and why? Why do we do that? We give up on the process because there's resistance. Resistance. We may begin a race, and then halfway through we end up gasping for breath, clutching our, our knees. <coughs> We've stopped. And the same is true in your faith journey. There is immense resistance to your growing closer and closer to Jesus. And you can get stuck. Your forward progress stops. You're unable to go. In, in Martin Luther's small catechism, he says that you face constant resistance from the devil, the world, and your sinful self. That these stop your forward progress in your relationship with Jesus. The devil, he'll plant doubt in your mind. Bring trouble into your life. God can't really love you. He can't really be real. And the world around you will get you sidetracked. Instead, you'll start pursuing pleasures, luxuries, comforts, riches, status. And then your sinful self will attack you so that you don't have the power to do what you said you're going to do. To keep going, to keep doing it, even though you want to. And the things that you say you're not going to do, I don't want to do that again, guess what? You fall and you end up doing that again. There was a study done of Christians who stopped growing in their faith journey. And it demonstrates the study that the very same truth. When believers get stuck, when they, they stop growing in their process of being closer to Jesus, the study found 27% get stalled in spiritual growth from addictions, from out-of-control spending addictions, or gambling, or pornography, or overeating. That makes sense. That's our sinful flesh. We fall and do those things. 15% of people who stopped in their spiritual growth, it was because of inappropriate relationships going on in their lives. Whether it was an emotional affair or a physical affair or other relationships, like maybe it's an unbelieving spouse who keeps saying, I want you to come and do this and, and you aren't spending the time to keep growing in your faith. Or it could be a boss who you ask for time to worship and doesn't understand that, or maybe even the kids' sports. 47% of believers who got stuck in their spiritual growth, they said it was because of emotional issues, depression, anger, stuffing their emotions, their feelings. 
31% of people who got stuck says gossip, too judgmental, not loving other people the way that they know they should. But here's the big one. 89% of believers who aren't growing closer to Jesus, they say that it boils down to nothing big. They said, it's just, I'm, I'm not prioritizing my spiritual growth. They're just spending time on TV and internet and movies and shopping. Almost 90% of Christians who aren't growing in their faith are too involved in just time-wasting, attention-grabbing, meaningless blither. And all of us, all of us encounter these sinful pressures. And maybe today, as you hear this, you can put your finger on one or more of these influences that are stunting your spiritual growth. And friends, do I need to tell you how deadly this is? How harmful for your faith and for your eternal life this is. You see, yet, even though we turn away from God so many times, even though we turn our back on our commitment to grow in loving Jesus with all of our heart and our soul and our mind, and even though we no way deserve another chance from God, Still, still God always wants to draw you closer to him. And so through your baptism, God made a promise that you are always his. He'll always be your loving father. He'll always welcome you home. If you're his son or daughter, he won't turn his back on you. In Holy Communion that we're going to receive today, God comes and personally forgives your past, applies to you what Jesus did when he died on the cross to pay for your sins, brings it right to you. In communion, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you to give you the power that if you've stumbled in your race to grow closer, gets you back up on your feet, dusts you off, and gets you running again. And God calls you through his word. He strengthens your faith, reassures your faith. And so a critical part of that is to be here this morning and to hear God's word and then plug into Bible study opportunities to be into God's word. When you're at home with your family, Bible reading times, prayer, family devotion, your personal Bible reading and prayer time, very important. And, and, God uses other people, other mature, wise Christians, people who care about you, people who will come alongside you to encourage you and pray for you and give you advice, other believers who can remind you when you're going through a difficult time of God's promises, believers who sometimes need to give you the swift kick in the hind end that you need when we need to hear it. And through these ways, see, God's always loving you. He's always, through all of these ways, drawing you closer and closer to Him. This week, in the uh, Natural Evangelism Small Group Bible Studies, uh, we're going to hear about the game of golf. Any of you played golf before? Okay, all right, a lot of hands go off, you play golf. So, you know, golf is a process of hitting a ball closer and closer and closer to the target, to the goal, to the hole, the cup. And in golf, it, it kind of reminds us of God who wants to draw you closer and closer and closer to Him, to a relationship with Him. Now, in golf, is a hole-in-one possible? Sure, it's possible. Does it happen every day? No way. Very rare. And in our lives, is our spiritual growth ever really quick? It can be, but most likely, most of the time, it's a lifelong process of growing closer. Now, the game of golf recognizes 
that the ball can be at different distances to the cup. And you know, your, your ball can be a long distance away back on the tee, or it can be in the middle of the fairway, you hit it once and you know, it's uh, maybe in the lake or the sand trap or off in the woods. Um, but you know, it, it's closer and you, you gotta hit it some more or your, your ball can be right up on the green. And there you hope that with one good putt, you're gonna get it right in. And because the ball is different distances from the cup, from the hole, well then there are different tools that you use, and these tools we call golf clubs. And there are different ones, aren't there? So if the ball is a long way off, and you're on the tee, you start with a driver. And you really line up and whack it to go a long way, hoping to get it up onto the green. And um, if you're on the fairway, maybe you use an iron, and there are different irons to use depending on the situation. When you finally get it up onto the green, you got a little putter, and you swing your hips and knock it in. So there are different tools depending on how far away the ball is from the, the cup. But all of these have one purpose. The one purpose is to get the ball into the hole. People are like balls, different distances from God. And God's got one purpose through everything he does, and his one purpose, you can see here, he desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of him. He wants every person to be, compared to the golf ball, into the hole close to him. He wants everyone saved. And God uses different tools, different golf clubs in people. And different people help us and encourage us. And we heard that in the New Testament lesson when Paul said, what is Apollos, what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And so he's saying that different people work in our lives at different times, all for the purpose of God using us to lead us closer and closer to Jesus. And if you think about your life, who's God used in your life to lead you closer to God? Parents, maybe grandparents, brother, sister, maybe a friend, college roommate, a neighbor. Maybe you're going through a tough time in your life, uh, a divorce, and a co-worker said, hey, um, you know, I, I think the church, there's a good one here, can, can help you. Maybe it was a spouse. You, you know, you started dating and somebody uh, helped you, even though you're, you know, growing closer that way. Has God used people to lead you closer to Jesus? Yeah. For me, I was born into a Christian family, baptized a month old. And so my parents, my parents took me to Sunday school. And I know Sunday school teachers and the devotions at home helped a lot. I uh, saw an example in my father and in his mother that uh, helped a lot. And then there's pastor and uh, one youth worker in particular went to the Lutheran college. And so the college friends, the roommates and all, uh, were very influential in my life. And God does that in our lives. He uses people to lead us closer to him. Now let's turn this around a little bit. Who do you know who's far from Christ? Can you think of three names? Just the first name will do. I'm going to ask you to write them down on that sermon note form, so grab a pen or a pencil and write it down. So, who has God placed in your, your life? Neighbors, family, children. Uh, who's God placed in your life? And you're concerned about them. You love them. And who are they 
who are far from Christ. Take a moment, pick, uh, I'll give you up to a minute, write down three names, okay? So here you go, and while you write, you can hear in your mind the Jeopardy music play. Okay. Some of you are still writing, some of you are looking up, some of you are reading. <clears throat> so God puts people in our lives, and depending on the person who you name, they could be like a golf ball who that is very far from a relationship with God, or have moved closer, or be very, very close to him, right? So it depends on the person. And on your sermon notes, you see printed for you, there's a box, and it comes from, uh, let's see the next slide. It comes from this. This is a study that was done that asked Christians, well, tell us about how you came to know Jesus and your faith relationship, the process and found that the answers kind of got grouped into four big categories, and they gave names to them, exploring Christianity, and then growing in Christ, and close to Christ, and then christ centered. And people can get stalled. In fact, the people interviewed, lots of them, responded that often they do get stalled, stunted in their growth, and the most common place for that to happen is right in the middle between growing in Christ and close to Christ. So let's take a look at these a little closer. In exploring Christianity, they don't have God involved in their lives. They view the Bible as irrelevant, and maybe you know folks who think of the Bible as irrelevant. If they need others to help them interpret spiritual issues, they only seek God's guidance when it's a time of need, kind of like dialing 911. That's the only time. If they're growing in Christ, then they've come to faith and they're beginning to incorporate some spiritual growth practices in their life. So they're discovering faith. They need help from others to understand their spiritual life. They participate in some groups. Some of them begin serving and they begin reading some Christian books and reading the Bible. But this is, after this is where a lot of people get stuck. Next comes close to Christ. And this is where serving emerges as being very important. It's an expression of their faith. Not serving because they have to, it's part of their faith. And uh, their devotion to Jesus is growing, but they hold back from full commitment. And probably in the biggest areas, that people struggle with committing to God in our finances and in sharing Jesus with others. You know, we don't tithe or we aren't willing to or don't know how to share his love with others. Finally, Christ-centered. These are close, really close. Uh, they fully surrendered their lives to Christ, demonstrated by their dramatically higher levels of spiritual behaviors and attitudes across the board. They very strongly agree that they seek God's guidance in every area of their lives at two times the level of any other segment. And so they're even beginning to lead and to mentor other people. And what the study found is that through all of these four uh, groups, that there were some things that kept growing and grew the most for those who were Christ-centered, and the things that kept growing are that prayer becomes central in our lives. 
that my prayer life is this continuous conversation with God all day long, that I rely on God's Word, the Bible, for guidance. And if I'm not in the Bible, boy, I really miss Him, miss God in my life. And so I want you to see these blessings that God gives increasingly, and He has even more as we grow closer and closer to Him, depending on Him, trusting Him. Would you like a life that isn't in gridlock with worry, that is free to uh, be yourself, to enjoy God's blessing, to rely on His guidance? You don't have those way to the world on your shoulders. Would you like that? God's got that for you. He wants to give that to you. These are His blessings. And so some takeaways for us today. Maybe today you discover, you know, I, I didn't know it before, but I think I'm stuck. I, I, I'm, the other areas, they don't describe my life. Okay, so maybe you found that. Your journey isn't quite complete. And for, as part of that, you saw how much more God wants to give to you. He loves you. He wants to bless you. And third, if you look at the, your list of three that you wrote down, three names, where are they? If you were to put them in those categories, uh, you know, of, of how people report where they grow in faith, where would you list them? And, and as you think of where they are, then ask yourself, oh God, how can you use me? What's their need? How can I come beside them? Because I can see what their questions are what their concerns are. God, how can you use me to facilitate his or her faith journey? And then last, when? When will you do it? In other words, don't just make a promise. Well, we need to put it in our calendar. So uh, make a commitment and write it down. And don't forget, don't forget that when the golf ball finally lands into the cup, what happens? The golfer celebrates. See? There's my Tiger Woods impersonation. Okay? So, don't forget to celebrate what God has done when people are brought closer and closer to faith in Jesus Christ. And you can be a part of that. I invite you to join me now in our prayer. As we reflect on our lives, we confess our sins to God. And um, uh, let's pray together. The words are on our screen. Lord, 